Tonight's guest is making her second appearance to the Walker stage. You may have caught Astra Taylor and her documentary, Examined Life, during the Walker's Women with Vision Film Festival last March when it screened to two sold-out audiences. Or perhaps you were here last night for our third screening of Examined Life. At age 30, she has directed two nonfiction features, including the 2008 film Examined Life, a peripatetic journey following nine influential thinkers who are given 10 minutes each to express their views on existence and the moral dilemmas of modern life and Zizek, the 2005 documentary that trails famed Slovenian philosopher Slavoj Zizek, a.k.a. the Elvis of cultural theory, across the globe. In 2006, Filmmaker Magazine listed her as one of 25 new faces to watch. Taylor's interest in taking on philosophical ideas that seem relegated to the ivory tower of academia and making them accessible to a broad audience didn't start at film school. She actually never attended film school, or any school, until age 13. She was unschooled, meaning there were no curriculum, no report cards, no recess or ringing bells to structure her daily regime of learning. Instead, each day was a self-guided approach to following whatever curiosities came to the surface. In keeping with the ideas central to raising creative kids, we've invited Astra to talk about how her experiences of being unschooled have guided her philosophy of learning and creativity. Before I welcome her to the podium, I want to let you know that there are select books on display and for sale in the shop that were culled from a list of Astra's favorite reads. And I'd like to encourage everyone to complete the visitor survey inside your program notes, and you can hand them to an usher on your way out. Uh, one lucky winner will be selected for, uh, to win a gift card to the Walker Shop. Also, there will be a Q&A following the talk, so please stay seated. Um, and we do ask that you raise your hand and wait for the mic to be presented to you as our, uh, the talk tonight is being recorded, and we want to be able to hear your question. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Astor Taylor. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, I just want to say thanks to the Walker Center for supporting Examine Life. It's, it was a real pleasure to come here and screen the film with, for the Women with Vision Film Festival. And Dean Otto and Cheryl Mosley were very kind hosts that time around. And I want to thank Ashley for inviting me back to talk about unschooling. Um, this is not a presentation I've ever given before. This is not something I've ever done. But it's a subject that's very uh, near and dear to my heart and something central to um, everything I've, I've done creatively, filmmaking-wise. So uh, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you guys about this. I wish I could do it extemporaneously, but I, there's so much that I want to say that I actually wrote a talk. But hopefully we can have a conversation, a dialogue, um, and do some more improvisation <laughs> after I'm finished with this. In the early 70s, 1972 uh, to be specific, when my mother was around 12 years old, she enrolled at the Carcross Community School, an alternative boarding school way up north in the Yukon Territory. So north, almost to the tree line, as far as you can go. And she, kept a, uh, she spent a couple of formative years there. Much of the curriculum, if you can call it that, centered on basic survival skills, building cabins, making crafts, and hunting wild caribou. Despite its far-flung location and near total isolation, Carcross was part of a radical education movement that was sweeping North America at that time. Like hundreds of other free schools crossing, cropping up across the continent, Carcross was a place that emphasized unmediated experience over instruction and authority. It was governed by a democratic system that put students and teachers on equal footing. A few were even dating. And the school's primary goal was inspiring students to participate in the running of their own lives. Academics were of secondary importance. They were taught rather informally, so sometimes the math teacher would resolve the uh, distasteful issue of grades by just throwing a dart at a dartboard, and that would be that. Um, though my mother's, tale, my mother's tales of the time there are, are sort of, she recalls the time with fondness, and they kind of emphasize two things, either the endless meetings that were required for the democratic decision-making decision process to function, um, so they spent hours and hours day after day in these meetings, or the disgusting affair of skinning a giant freshly killed caribou. Um, still, Carcross's educational ethos left a tremendous mark on her. 
introducing my mother to the theories and practice of radical pedagogy, a current that was seemingly forgotten by the time my siblings and I became school-aged in the 1980s. Eventually, my mother left the Yukon Territory, and she met my father, who had been subjected to a very strict um, elementary school education in Bermuda. From there, his family moved to Canada, and in comparison to the students, uh, he was very far ahead academically. In fact, he was the official math whiz kid of Canada, and there are some amazing newspaper articles with him in his little button-up shirt and his glasses. Um, he enrolled in university at the age of 14, and he lingered on as an undergraduate for well over a decade, following his two passions, playing guitar and doing chemistry. Um, eventually I was born, I, there's proof of that, and we moved to the States, first to Tucson, Arizona, and then later to Athens, Georgia, which is where, uh, it's the place I really consider home. My dad got his PhD in medicinal chemistry, he had an interest in psychopharmacology, um, <clears throat> and he became a professor. My mom continued her work as a painter and an artist, and for various reasons they decided not to send us to school. Most importantly, I think, uh, was the fact that the school refused to mainstream my younger sister, Sonora, uh, because of her physical disability. You might re remember Sonora if you've seen Examine Life. Uh, she's the woman in the wheelchair walking with Judith Butler. Um, but I think the real reason that attending school was not a given in my household was that neither of my parents had been su subjected to the conventional educational experience of moving from kindergarten through grade 12 and into college in a linear fashion. My mother's countercultural upbringing and my father's nerdy precocity colluded to keep us at home. So unlike the rest of our peers, my siblings and I slept late. We never knew what day of the week it was. We were never tested, we were never graded, we never had to memorize dates, facts, or figures. So we called ourselves unschoolers. Back in the 60s and early 70s, when my mom was doing her stint stalking caribou, books about radical education were flying off the press. First and most famously was A.S. Neal's book, Summer Hill, A Radical Approach to Child Rearing, um, an account of running an anti-authoritarian boarding school in England that still exists. And I just want to pause on the fact that this book sold three million copies between 1960 and 1973. So that's kind of a mind-boggling number and gives you a sense of how mainstream these conversations were. Um, there are also books like Paul Goodman's Compulsory Miseducation in 1964, Jonathan Kozol's Death at an Early Age in Free Schools in 1967 and 72, John Holt's How Children Fail and How Children Learn, published in 64 and 67, Carl Rogers' Freedom to Learn, George Dennison's The Lives of Children in 69. These are just some of the most influential. There are books like School is Dead and Education is Ecstasy, which have not become classics of the genre, but I really like their titles. Um, <laughs> In those early days, the magazine Growing It Without Schooling, which was published well into the 90s, was delivered to your mailbox in a brown paper bag, as though um, its pages were full of something as controversial or maybe as shameful as pornography. So almost 40 years ago, riding the wave of political and cultural upheaval that defined the 1960s, it seemed to many that education was on the brink of a breakthrough. First, there were the freedom schools that had been part of the civil rights movement. Next, were, there were the free schools founded across the country with a commitment to child-centered learning. There were hundreds and hundreds of these, maybe thousands. There's no exact number. Finally, there was the widespread campus unrest, the movement against the Vietnam War, of course, and the massive student strikes that shook the nation. The student strikes were really serious. Millions of students uh, you know, refused to ascend, attend classes and shut down their schools. So, um, and that was coupled with the establishment of open universities where idealistic students and faculty sought to liberate education from the tyranny of accreditation. Though it's hard to imagine it today, these cultural challenges filtered into the mainstream, much to the alarm of government officials who ultimately launched an effective counterattack that we'll hear more about in a bit. Over the last four decades, self-education, free schools, and open universities have faded into the background of our collective memory, relegated to the dustbin of failed utopian experiments. Today, for example, the prospect of a book like Summer Hill, one that paints a sympathetic portrait of kids who just refuse to do what the grown-ups say, reaching an audience of millions is kind of, it seems absurd to me. Um, I don't think it would happen. And instead of such rousing clarion calls, instead of books that deeply question the nature of schooling, who, uh, books that ask us why, why is school really necessary, we get these kind of mealy-mouthed, well-meaning critiques like under pressure, rescuing our children from the culture of hyper-parenting, or the homework myth, why our kids get too much of a bad thing. Well-meaning studies illuminating many of the traps parents and children unwittingly set for children. 
These and countless other recent books and articles rightly criticize the current emphasis on testing and tracking, our obsession with enriching kids like their bags of flour, <laughs> and our single-minded obsession with climbing to the top of the meritocracy no matter how rigged and meaningless it is to begin with. But in the end, they make no rousing or imaginative suggestions of other ways to live and to learn. Instead, they advise parents to stay on the well-trodden path of standardized schooling. So just travel down it a bit slower. After school tutoring is okay, just do a little bit of it. SAT prep classes are fine, just in moderation. Because the thing is, you don't want your kid to lose the edge. You don't want them to fall behind. In contrast, in the 1960s and 70s, people were discussing the possibility of finding a different route altogether. There was a public conversation underway about educational possibilities when aimed at empowering each person to find their own intellectual and creative way through the world. It is certainly worth wondering where all of the ideas, compassion, and visionary suggestions of these radical pedagogues of the past disappeared to. What happened over the last 40 years to kind of erase their legacy and diminish the educational imagination that so many people tried so hard to open up? I will answer that question shortly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's just say there were not very many unschoolers in Athens, Georgia in the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, though our more known and staid counterparts, the Christian fundamentalist homeschoolers, could be found in abundance. Uh, once we went to a homeschool playgroup and the parents organized the kids into a game of uh, religious Red Rover. And basically, we never went back and I really don't think they missed us. It was obvious that they didn't like us at all. Um, unlike those families, our parents weren't trying to limit our exposure to the outside world. or from They weren't trying to shelter us from potentially corrupting points of view. Instead, the world was our classroom. That's what we would always say. And in theory, at least, nothing was off limits. We were different from homeschoolers in other essential ways. We weren't re replicating school in the home. We had no textbooks, no class times, no schedules, no deadlines, no tests, no curricula. Instead, our parents encouraged us to trust our abilities to cultivate our own unique, usually idiosyncratic, interests at our own pace. Are you fascinated by primates, by rocks, by baseball cards? Whatever you're interested in, go forth. They trusted our curiosity, which is our most basic human capacity, and that really is what this whole debate about compulsory education centers on. Do we trust people's capacity to be curious? Do we trust them to be in charge of themselves or not? Do we trust people to be inquisitive, to follow their own innate desire to investigate, to seek knowledge, or do we believe people need to be led? Have you ever met anyone who isn't interested in something? Obviously, sometimes people's interests are not interesting to you. This happens. But people are always interested in something. Have you ever met someone who is incapable of learning? Think about babies. Generally speaking, because there are exceptions, do infants need to be taught to speak or walk? After all, we don't take babies to speaking or walking class. Instead, parents facilitate infant learning, and learning by speaking to them and holding their hands and encouraging them. John Holt, who coined, coined the term unschooling in the early 70s, put it this way, the human animal is a learning animal. We like to learn. We are good at it. We don't need to be shown how or made to do it. What kills the processes are the people interfering with it and trying to regulate or control it. So it's a very romantic idea, right? One that goes back to Rousseau, one that manifested in the modern school movement that took shape in Europe, in the US, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which is a movement uh, everyone should go back and investigate. It really inspired Emma Goldman and many people like her. It's an impulse that emerges in humanist philosophy, like in John Dewey, for example. It's basically the idea that people are inherently good and that by removing authoritarian social constraints, that goodness can flourish. And so at our house, the social constraints were as moved were removed, sorry, as much as they could be at least. Our curiosity and creativity was not regulated or controlled, though I have no doubt that it was influenced and facilitated, and those are different things, I think. As the oldest of four siblings, I often wrangled my younger sisters and my brother into grandiose projects, convincing them to star in elaborate homemade movies or bizarre puppet shows. When we weren't in production and some bizarre spectacle, we spent countless afternoons exploring the creeks and woods behind our ramshackle house, planting gardens that rarely flourished or trying to talk to the landlord's horses in the back fields. Some days we read books. We made music, we painted, we drew. Other days we argued amongst ourselves and fought over the computer. Endless afternoons were spent watching reruns of The Simpsons, even though we knew every word by heart. And when we weren't that inspired, which was quite often, we did nothing. We were allowed to just do nothing. 
And for my family, unschooling worked. We are all literate. We can all balance a checkbook. And we have all had the opportunity, uh, whether we've taken it or not, to pursue higher education. And I use higher in quotes. For the last six uh, years, I've worked as a filmmaker and a writer with a focus on philosophy. And I don't have degrees in creative writing, filmmaking, or philosophy. Um, in addition to be, uh, being in my most recent documentary, Sonora, my sister, is now 27, and she has an MFA in art practice from the University of California at Berkeley, where she is currently teaching a course on animal rights and disability uh, issues. She's about to show her paintings for the second time at the Smithsonian Institute. Um, our brother Alex is 25, and like me, he's a philosophy nerd, but he's also a big computer geek. He makes his living reselling fancy mic uh, microscopes and bicycle parts on eBay. Uh, Tara, the youngest, is 17. She actually left home at the age of 14 with the blessing of my parents, who had moved with her to a town in North Carolina, and she wasn't happy there. So now she lives with my brother, and when she's not working at the health food co-op, she makes textiles and crafts. Early th her, earlier this year, she got a high school um, equivalency from this place called Clonlora, which it basically translates the experiences of unschoolers into credit hours, so that if you want, you can go on to college. Um, I'm not sure if that's what she's going to do, but it might be. Um, if it seems like we're the exception to some rule, we're not. We are the rule. Even the mainstream has been forced to acknowledge the success of the progressive homeschooling moment, movement and its uh, conservative counterpart as well. Kids school at home do better on standardized tests. We are typically marvelously well behaved. We get along well with others, especially grown-ups, and that's because we haven't been indoctrinated to the ageism at the heart of compulsory schooling. Um, Ivy League universities hunt out homeschoolers, even those who stayed self-taught through the crucial high school years. So, for example, Stanford has a special, you know, paid part of its website geared towards recruiting homeschoolers. A few years ago, in Brown University's alumni magazine, a dean declared homeschoolers to be the epitome of Brown students. They are self-directed. They take risks and they don't back off. Harper's Magazine validated his observation, reporting that one in three American adults believe that politics and government are too complicated to understand. In contrast, the chances that an American who is homeschooled would agree with that statement are only 1 in 25. So that's a big difference. The potential of self-education has been proven time and time again. Think of the litany, the litany of luminaries who never went to school. Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Edison, Franklin D. Roosevelt. This should be enough to convince even the most conservative skeptic of the power of autodidacticism. And if these historic figures seem too distant, think of your favorite artists, your favorite musicians, writers, inventors, and see how many of them dropped out of high school at some point or actually taught themselves. Or think about all the people you know who fell into surprising careers they didn't get training for, or who practiced some sort of hobby or craft after hours or on the weekends. Unschooling, or learning, if you prefer, is everywhere. The question is why most schooling seems geared towards quarantine, the, quarantining the experience of learning as opposed to unleashing it. Because isn't that what school does, right? For 55 minutes, you do math, and then you do biology, or whatever it might be. And right when you're in the flow of things, the bell rings, and it's time to move on to something else. The, subject are, the subjects are separated from each other as though there's some reason to fear cross-contamination, like English can't touch history, or something bad would happen. I know this to be true because over the years, I tried school. At different junctures for different reasons, my siblings and I all tried school. We were curious how the other 99% lived. I tried fourth grade, for example, where the trivializing emotions associated with immaturity, greed, envy, fear, conformity, triumphed over the inspiring and desirable attributes of childhood, curiosity, imagination, playfulness. I was tormented for the usual petty things, as I'm sure many of us were, for not having Ked sneakers, for not wearing deodorant. I was eight. Did I really need it? <laughs> Sonora still shudders at her memory of a traumatic day spent riding the bus to special ed. Alex went to sixth grade, where he was beaten up for t calling the two boys who picked on him homo sapiens. <laughs> These experiences reinforced our sense that staying home was a privilege. We were being spared inane heckling, and who wouldn't heckle us? I was bucktooth and incredibly bookish. My sister's disabled. My brother looked like a girl. We were soft targets. And, you know, we called school, we would call kids who went to school school kids. And we wondered, why, why are they so mean? Why are they so aggressive? Why do they hate us? So we knew we were being spared this harassment and that we were being spared meaningless consumer pressure. I didn't even want kid sneakers. I just wanted to not be made fun of. And we were also being spared untold hours. Make that years of absolutely unnecessary and insulting boredom. 
boredom is the big thing. That's what we were released from. School acclimates children to boredom so that as adults they can work long hours at jobs they will more than likely describe as uneventful, mind-numbing, soul-destroying, in other words, as boring. But school also inculcates children into boredom as an attitude, a habit, a way of being in the world. Boredom is more than a consequence of bad curriculum or poor, te poor teaching style. It's actually an ethos, one that lingers on into adult life. Schoolwork, for example, is to be done dutifully or avoided entirely, but never to be savored or enjoyed. And I'm always stunned when people say to me, as they often do, weren't you bored at home? I think these people are out of their minds. Do they even remember being in school? Schools are factories of ennui, restlessness, lethargy, monotony, tedium. Just think back to the chewing of pencils, the mindless doodling, the staring off into space, the desperate passing of notes, the trying to look busy when you're about to start dozing. Think back to what school was really like, and not some idealized fantasy or a few selected highlights from 13 years. And chances are you will recall being bored out of your skull. So were we bored at home? No. My mom would say, when you're bored, you're boring, a phrase that still rings in my ears. This phrase reveals what might be the essence of self-education, the forceful injunction at the heart of unschooling, its reverse psychology, if you will. You don't have to learn because you'll get in trouble or because you're going to fail a test or because there's a teacher who's threatening or cajoling you, right? You have to learn because you want to because there's something in you that wants to reach out and touch the world and wants to communicate with it. Think about all those hours of time most kids are forced to waste in boredom at school. Sure, we bickered, we made mud pies, we rode our bikes in circles, but we also got to focus deeply on the things that we really cared about. So I'm going to spare you and give you some audio visual. Something around there. Okay, so that's the puppet show I was mentioning. I don't have very many digitized photographs, thank God. Um, and then just to show you, there I am in a tie-dye that I made. And my brother does look like a girl. Um, so that's the family painting. Um, basically, you know, my passion, were, my passion was animal rights and uh, environmental issues because I really saw the two as, as linked. Um, and perhaps the reason I felt that so strongly was because my, my sister is actually disabled because of military industrial toxic waste that was in the groundwater in Tucson where she was born and so um, the idea of you know, environmental toxicity of pollution was sort of very palpable but I never thought of it that way when I was a kid I just thought that this was the thing to be passionate about so when I was 11 and 12, this is 1992 I had made this magazine and I took this incredibly seriously. And it's kind of hilarious now looking at the table of contents. Animal testing stinks. <laughs> People are so mean. <laughs> There's some other funny ones too. Ways to recycle trash. Um, so here's another issue. Letters to write. You can save mountain gorillas. And Thoughts on War by Aaron Williams, age 10. This was a friend of ours about Jane Addams. This is a sister, uh, sorry, a profile of Albert Schweitzer, Sunny, my sister wrote. So she would have been around 10 maybe. And that's a drawing she did. Um, Sunny got to devote herself to painting with a sort of intensity of focus that you don't get in the regular world until you're a graduate student, if you're lucky enough to ever become a graduate student. She painted, once she realized she could paint, when she was about 12, she painted every day. She became obsessed with it, first the Pre-Raphaelites and then moved on to other schools of painting from there. Uh, these are some very early works, maybe when she was 15 or 16, she did all these romantic paintings of women with animals. That's me with an aardvark. <laughs> it's from life, as you can tell. Uh, this is later, maybe when she was 19 or 20. This is the musician Vic Chestnut. Um, who's an amazingly talented man. Uh, this is, these are large, about eight feet, maybe by five feet. Um, this is her most recent work. This is a huge painting of chickens. Um, then this is the little sister, Tara Taylor, who's 17 now and related to crafts. This is one of her craft setups with vegan cookies in the corner, some crazy stuff she made. Um,
My brother doesn't get any slides. But, um, but like us, his interests, you know, his interest in video games, for example, is taken really seriously. He taught himself how to animate and program, to do 3D modeling and design before going on to intern at a firm in New York when he was only 16. But what that helped him do is realize he didn't want to work in the field professionally. He actually didn't want to be a computer programmer. And if he had been on the orthodox path, he may not have realized that until after he had a degree in this field that he really didn't want to be employed in. He, he wanted to do it as a hobby, but he didn't want to do it for work. So the point of all this is that we liked unschooling. It freed us to be ourselves. But as the oldest kid in my small community, I was concerned about my future. I didn't have any role models, and we were isolated in a pre-internet bubble. What became of grown-up unschoolers? I had no idea. At the time, I thought I wanted to be a physicist or some sort of scientist, and even if I could have managed to teach myself hard science, I was pretty sure that that wouldn't count for much in the outside world. So going to public school, as far as I could tell, was my only option. So at 13, I enrolled in ninth grade, and the truth is I was shocked, disappointed even, by how fast I came to identify with my public school peers, feeling just as disaffected and trapped as I imagined they must feel. Day after day, I had to remind myself that I was actually choosing to be there. My parents, in sharp contrast to most people's, would have welcomed me home with open arms if I had stood up in the middle of a monotonous lecture and just stormed out. They would have they, you know, I could have marched past those police officers and they would have welcomed me with open arms and said, yeah, school's a drag, it's like a prison, come home. They would have been pleased. But, um, and, but even though I had their support, which is far more than most people have, I, I lacked the larger social support necessary to make such a bold move. Society told me that if I didn't go to college, I would fall behind in adult life. Even if I avoided being ignorant, I would not be accredited, and that frankly seemed like an even more damning fate. It was better to be dumb with a degree. So when I first got back to, so when I first got to school, I presumed that the other students would be envious of my laid-back upbringing. But to my surprise, most of them were absolutely aghast. They would say things like, I wouldn't know what to do with myself all day, or oh, I wouldn't want my mom for my teacher. The majority were incapable of imagining that my mother wasn't my teacher, and that's what was so great about it. We were our own teachers. But there were some kids, a minority, that really got it right away. And I realized that they were trying to cultivate in the school what we already had at home. These were the kids who failed classes not out of ignorance or indolence, but because of the sheer inanity of it. They were the ones who read books like Catch-22 under the desk during grammar lessons. But I was reading less. Over the course of three year, the three years I attended public high school, I read fewer books than I did the month before I enrolled. All told, I read, what was the sign in the textbooks? Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and a book by Nancy Reagan's astrologer for an advanced placement uh, political science course. <laughs> so that was a far cry from what I had read when I was an unschooler, when you couldn't get books away from me. For, I remember one time I was so immersed in Watership Down that my, and I would not respond to my mom, that she literally grabbed the book from my hands and threw it out the moving car window, and rightfully so, because I just, I would never pay attention to her. I was always just in my books. So I, I went from being a lover of words to being a lover of standardized tests. You know, I took so many standardized tests those three years. Public high school was a sociological experiment, an existential adjustment, an extended lesson in procedure, routine, convention. Never before had I had asked permission to have a drink of water, go to the bathroom. Never did I have to feign activity and look busy when in fact I was bored and doing nothing important. Uh, the academics were a breeze. I was years ahead in math and science and English and history. I was behind in Spanish. Um, but I confess there was a certain pleasure I found a certain pleasure in handing over my agency, in shifting from the ambiguity of unschooling, where there are no clear metrics for success, to the authoritarian structure of school, where I knew that I was doing well by the system's own strange logic. I got kudos daily, not for my brilliance, but for my diligence. And like all students, I began to see myself reflected in the marks I received. In high school, I will admit, my social life improved. In fact, one of my friends who I, my first friend I made is in the audience somewhere. Um, so I was fortunate enough to kind of skip the awkward middle school, junior high school years. And when I enrolled in public school, I wasn't being made fun of for my lack of kids anymore. I found the friends that I'd wanted, not to mention a handful of committed teachers who I'm still in touch with, <clears throat> but not the nurturing intellectual community that I craved. 
Determined, I held out for life after graduation, convinced college would be different because that's what they tell you. But by the, and so by the time I was 16, I abandoned high school to enroll at the University of Georgia. And then the next year, I went to Brown University in Rhode Island. I was going to the most liberal school in the Ivy League, a place where everyone assured me I would belong. I realized my mistake the first day at Brown when the administrators assembled the entire freshman class in the auditorium. You are all the most smart and capable of your generation, they told us. This is the best place to be, and you are here because you are the best. And when I was sitting there, I knew that what they were saying wasn't true. And I knew that I had made a terrible mistake. Um, I knew that we weren't the smartest or the best. And I had this suspicion that actually we were kind of the cowards of our class, that we were the grade mongers, the brown nosers, the play by the rulers, the approval seekers, right? We had hustled for A's and submitted to the system, doing pointless assignments, building our resumes at the age of 16 and 17, writing obsequious college essays, and we were kind of too spineless to rock the boat. Um, so as the semester progressed, I felt trapped in a ghetto of my peers and even more isolated from the outside world than I had in high school. One cold afternoon, I was complaining to a friend of my unhappiness. This was a, a friend who was not a Brown student, a friend who had been raised in a housing project, a friend who didn't know his dad, whose mom was in jail, uh, a friend who never went to college, even though he is now the CTO of this big um, Pro, like company, I don't even know what it does. He's a computer programmer. He writes all these books about writing computer code. Um, so he was an unschooler by inclination, but also by necessity, because you know educational opportunities I took for granted were not available to him. So he asked why I I was attached to the idea of getting a degree in physics. He's, he said, "Why? It's not like you do science when you're not in school." His off the cuff his off the cuff remark shook me to my core. I enjoyed physics and math, it was true, but he was right. I didn't really engage with the material on my own time out of the classroom. Was there anything I loved enough to pursue outside of that framework? Did I even know who I was or what I liked to think about anymore? Our conversation forced me to ask some uncomfortable questions. How does someone who has embraced the ethos of unschooling measure success? Why had I felt compelled to enroll in an Ivy League school to excel by the standards of compulsory education instead of making my own way? What was I afraid of? My parents thought Brown was a joke. They never seemed impressed by my acceptance at this elite university, and they only seemed relieved that I got financial aid. Years later, my dad said he was happy that I got over my silly Ivy League thing. <laughs> Looking back, I must have, as a small kid, somehow absorbed the skepticism of strangers who would sometimes come up to me in a, in a very condescending way and go, can you count to 10? Do you know your alphabet? I had seen articles in Growing Without Schooling about homeschoolers who had gone to Harvard, and I must have decided I should do the same, and that that would show all the cynics. But is that what unschooling is all about? Finding a back door to conventional academic accolades? Is it just about being the meritocracy at its own stupid game? Does my miserable stint at Brown, or the fact that I got my BA, which I, I did the next year back in Georgia, and then enrolled in graduate school at the age of 19 really mean anything at all. On the one hand, these achievements signal that I was academically competitive despite my unusual upbringing, which is comforting to some. On the other hand, they also reveal my own competitiveness, which probably stemmed from insecurity. The fact that I needed to be validated, that I needed to be accepted in a social world that I felt wouldn't see or accept me if I didn't bear the proper insignias. What I realized at Brown during that disappointing year was that unschooling is a lifelong commitment. It's not something you do until you are 18 or you get your high school equivalency degree. It's not a stepping stone to career or college. Unschooling is an ethos, kind of like boredom, but hopefully it's opposite. I realized it was my duty to take back the reins of my own education, to get in touch with my inquisitive nature, to set my own standards for engagement and mastery. The difference between educating and credentialing is profound which isn't to say you don't need credentials sometimes in this world to get a job, to make a living, because you do. My point is simply that we should not mistake one process for the other. And if we're talking about a basic high school or college degree, it's worth asking the question, what do academic credentials signify anyway? As I see it, they are a sign that a person can play by the rules and can be managed. In an insightful article published in 2004, John Taylor Gatto, who is actually a former New York State Teacher of the Year and taught in public high schools for 30 years, argues that it is not the potential of self-education that has yet to be demonstrated, but that its success has to be suppressed in the service of compulsory education's true purpose. The cultivation of thoughtless acquiescence 
and conspicuous consumption defines our culture and fuels, and fuels the economy. Thus, the education system's ultimate goal, according to Gatto, isn't to impart knowledge or to inspire love thereof, but to train young people not to think much at all, because that's what makes them good employees and good consumers. If that's a bit too conspiracy theory for you, please reconsider. Despite their democratic claims, our society's elites have long seen compulsory schooling as a mechanism to contain and control a potentially unruly citizenry. In 1909, Woodrow Wilson, who was then president of Princeton University, put it this way in a speech to the New York City School Teachers Association. We want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific and difficult manual tasks. A half century later, Sidney P. Marland was appointed Commissioner Delegate of Education under Richard Nixon and given the mission of increasing job preparation among students during the recession of the 70s, right as employment opportunities were drying up. In 74, Marlin said, we should view the future generations of learners in America as coming to maturity at a time when society may not require all their intellectual and developed capacities in the workforce. In other words, the economy doesn't need, nor does it have the space for an abundance of developed, self-possessed thinking citizens. And such citizens are just trouble anyway. According to scholar Ira Shore, in the eyes of Marlin and Nixon, the quote, broad critical learning possible in the liberal arts and women's courses, minority programs, interdisciplinary studies represented the political problems of the 1960s. Men like Marlon and Nixon consider the humanities, which foster critical thinking and political consciousness, a serious threat to social stability, economic productivity, and the status quo. They promoted vocational training and job preparation as the solution. So the wisdom presented by writers like A.S. Neal, John Holt, John Taylor Gatto, and others is simple enough that people need less schooling not more. But today the answer is always more. We need more funding, more teachers, more textbooks, more discipline, more class time, more homework, more tests, more standards, more accountability, more authority, more preparation for menial, menial and meaningless work. Since the 1960s, the school day has the school, both the school day sorry, and the academic year have lengthened considerably. The amount of homework assigned to a first grader has more than doubled since 1981. The surge has even you know, made the New York Times sound the alarm. As if that's not enough, parents buy baby Einstein programs. They fork over fortunes for private tutors. They hire professionals to coach their kids through the college application process. Schools, meanwhile, have become monumental warehouses holding thousands of students, many of whom begin their day watching Channel One, for -pro for-profit news channel, or they use computers with advertisements on the screen. You know, some of them are whisked off to McDonald's for credit. So petty domination, more often than not, is the order of the day. They're monitored by security guards, by police. They're subjected to an ever-increasing number of standardized tests and diminishing educational opportunities in the fine and liberal arts to cope people turn to chemicals. Ritalin, for example, is prescribed to millions of children. I think six million kids are on some sort of behavioral modifying drug. But in the 1960s, people believed the system was sick, but now it seems we think our children are. No wonder my parents wanted to help their kids escape from this absurd fate. And with a physically disabled child, the school system refused to mainstream. They had extra impetus to do so. I'm grateful to them, as you can probably tell. But standing here now as an adult with progressive politics, the whole discussion brings up some uncomfortable contradictions. Now that I've sung, un sung unschooling's praises, I want to share some of my doubts about it. In his book, Free Schools, published in 1972, the great education critic Jonathan Kozol, you guys might all know his book, Savage Inequalities. It's kind of a classic, right? Um, makes a provocative case against pro progressive education becoming yet another exclusive realm of the privileged. Starting an isolated upper class free school is a great deal too much like a sandbox for children of the SS guards at Auschwitz, he says with his usual panache. Um, Kozol is very harsh. Free schools, however, is not just a critique but a practical guide, one aimed to inspire and instruct teachers and parents to found free schools in urban and suburban communities. The book is based on a now forgotten history. The enormous contribution people of color made to the alternative education movement. If the radical education movement of the 60s got its start anywhere, it was in these freedom schools that uh, emerged during Mississippi's Freedom Summer, 1964. Um, and these have kind of been written out of the history of alternative education in this country. So Kozol's contention simply is not that free schools or unschooling are bad, but that the very populations that are in need of these uh, types of 
educational opportunities aren't getting, aren't getting access to them. So the problem is not that some children are saved from the public school system, but that the ones who really need to be saved aren't. In the face of public school deprivation, when thousands of kids lack textbooks or even clean bathrooms, the dream of democratic education strikes many as hopelessly frivolous, self-indulgent, naive, insensitive. This is a world, after all, where the children of an all-black school in St. Louis receive a public education worth 8,000 a year, while their white counterparts in Lake Forest receive 18,000. For many, practical concerns trump radical critique. Theoretical conversations about the psychic effect of compulsory schooling kind of seem spurious when the bottom line is a gross, often race-based inequality. Others have argued that by sending children to private schools or keeping them at home, parents passively reinforce social segregation, allowing public schools to fall into even greater disrepair in their absence. So where unschooling is, uh, sorry, where unschooling is concerned, I just want to ask some questions. What's the relationship between the individual and the collective, between the private and the public? The fact that some of the most vocal supporters of learning at home are people like Grover Norquist, who famously says he wants to shrink government down to the size where he can drown it in a bathtub, should give us pause. What kind of individualism does unschooling promote? Is it an isolationist individualism? A sort of, I've got mine mentality. My kids are safe at home being creative. Too bad for everybody else. Or is it an expressive individualism, one that empowers kids to trust themselves, their in, to trust their instincts, their personal learning style, their unique abilities, their sense of right and wrong? Does unschooling privatize the educational experience, cloistering it within, within the parochial democ uh, sorry, domestic sphere? Or does it make learning a public act? Right? Something that is not done, hidden away behind closed doors in classrooms, but then in social space, encouraging children to take advantage of every new experience and encounter as an opportunity for investigation and illumination. And while I'm pointing out problems, how about gender issues? How about the fact that the great theorists of liberation education I just mentioned, John Holt, Ivan Illich, John Taylor Gatto, the list goes on, are all men. But the people who actually do the unschooling, who stay at home with the kids, are more than often women. We need to ask ourselves whether uh, as a pedagogical practice, unschooling jobs with our feminist values, our abhorrence of racism, our desire for a society without economic inequality. The fact is there are many ways that unschooling can reinforce social hierarchies and these issues have to be discussed. These aren't easy issues to settle because we live in an imperfect world. Compromises must be made. In many ways, unschooling was a compromise. The more appealing of the only two extremes available to me, I could either stay at home and teach myself, or I could go to public school and have my spirit crushed. What I really wanted, and what I still want, is that intellectual community I was looking for in high school and college and never really found. And in many ways, I think the films that I've chosen to direct are attempts to create such a community in unexpected spaces in cinemas. I would have loved to commune with other young people and to study marine biology or number theory or playwriting a couple afternoons a week. But for some reason, such a possibility was unthinkable, a wild fantasy. Instead, the only option available was to submit to a rational authority, eight hours a day, five days a week, in a series of cinder block holding cells. We should wonder why there's no middle ground. Often when I talk to people about these issues, they say, unschooling worked for you, but admit that it won't work for everyone. On the one hand, it implies that my family is exceptional, that we're gifted to use the public school parlance. So, okay, it's kind of a compliment. But on the other hand, it implies that most people are not gifted and that they need to be guided, molded, tested, and inspected. But what makes us so sure most people couldn't handle self-education? Why do we want to believe that the masses can't be trusted to teach themselves? Why are we so militantly against the prospect of other people's kids being left to their own devices to daydream, to play, to figure out what it is they want to do? John Taylor Gatto put it this way. After a long life and 30 years in public school trenches, I've concluded that genius is as common as dirt. We suppress our genius only because we haven't yet figured out how to manage a population of educated men and women. We shouldn't forget Wilson, Marland, and Nixon, powerful politicos who actually engineered academic curriculum to instill lowered expectations and a willingness to settle for less in the students exposed to it. The empowerment that comes from liberal education was something they wanted to reserve for elites like themselves. As someone who actually believes my family was exceptional only in our actions and not in some innate sense, as someone who actually believes genius is as common as dirt, I don't want to reinforce these elitist divisions even inadvertently. Unschooling fundamentally is driven by a profound trust in the human capacity to be curious. 
The challenge we face, and it's a difficult one, is finding a way to extend this trust outwards beyond the home and into the public sphere where it is so desperately needed. Thank you very much. Should we just yeah. have a dialogue? Anybody want to throw in some two cents? I think we need, um, who's got the microphone? Okay, we must wait for the microphone. Could, could you distinguish between your conception of homeschooling yep. versus non-schooling? Yep. The distinction between homeschooling and unschooling. Yes. Um, homeschoolers are a various group, and some actually unschool. But in general, it's this, it's this idea of replicating school in the home. So you actually do school in the sense that you have a curriculum, you have a schedule, you have some sort of sense of... Uh, things you need to master in a certain time frame and you need to master them according to certain standards, right? Um, so that would be homeschooling. And maybe even your parent, probably your mother, but maybe your father, sort of plays teacher with you, right? And you do a lesson together, you have a lesson plan, you have some books that you, um, you know, it's like you go to math class, it's just in your kitchen. Unschooling uh, doesn't, isn't hung up about school at all. It's not, it's the total absence of those, um, those pretenses to, you know, you're not playing school all day, you're playing, right? And it's this idea that you can kind of, if you allow a child to just express their true instincts, well, their true instincts are ones that move towards, they move towards the world, they're curious about the world, they're going to learn about things. You don't need to channel it into some sort of framework that resembles what we have in school. So there was a complete absence of, you know, any sort of routine or schedule that, you know, a, a school kid would recognize from their usual experience, right? Yeah. Uh, you didn't talk much about your parents. Um, did they really play no role in mm -hmm. supporting your education? Um, I'm also curious about if you're just playing and exploring, how did you discover that you needed physics books and mm -hmm. where did you get those kinds yeah. of materials? Yeah, I mean, I said sort of in a, I sort of, I said that we were influenced and facilitated, right, but not necessarily led. So I always think of our home as sort of a nutrient rich environment, right, and they kind of unleashed us. They let us explore this environment. So there were musical instruments and there were science books. My, you know, my parents have a really good library, a book collection, and uh, computers. So it was a very rich place to be. There was a lot to be interested in. And of course, they indulged our passion. So when I wanted nothing more than to make this newsletter, somebody had to drive me to Kinko's, you know. But they didn't, they didn't sort of always stand over us. It was like, okay, you need some tools. Well, here are some tools. And occasionally there was resistance, like I wanted piano lessons at one point. And they were like, yeah, just, you know, if you don't have the motivation to teach yourself piano, like, I'm going to get you a piano lesson. So, but there was this fundamental in encouraging and facilitating is the word that people often use, you know. You don't say, oh, kid, well, I don't have anything to do with you and your education, teach yourself. But it's like, well, what do you want to do? I'll help you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have three children, and they all go to a local democratic free school that's actually on its 40th year this year here. Mm -hmm. Has 30-some um, children. And the kids are basically unschooling at school. Um, so they have a great social interaction, and they have each other. Some years are more academically minded than others, and the kids mm -hmm. are free to do what they want. And I guess my question kind of piggybacks the last one. Um, when I think about my eight-year-old who is 
I'm certain is a genius, but spends weeks and months with Legos, but I can't get them to sit down and read. Was there some point where your parents got panicky, like I get panicky about their future? Yeah. I mean, for myself, the reason they're there is I hated school every day, and everything I learned I taught myself. Yeah. But I don't see that same desire sometimes with them, but maybe that's because they have the freedom to take their time, whereas I really didn't. Yeah. Um, I have different thoughts. I mean, one thing, <laughs> did my parents ever worry? I, I'm almost amazed at how my parents didn't seem to worry. I never saw it, if they were. I'm quite a bit older than my youngest sister. I was 12 when she was born, right? So when she was nine, I was, you know, 20, one or something, and uh, Sunny and Alex and I were a little worried by the fact that she was kind of illiterate. <laughs> and we thought, this is kind of a problem. Um, and so I remember talking to them at one point, thinking, what should we teach her? What should we do? Should we secretly teach her things? Or Not even secretly. I mean, my parents, they wouldn't have minded. Um, but basically, one day, she f discovered the internet, and she discovered eBay. And she discovered you could search for vintage Barbies on eBay. And all of the adults around her got bored of doing this in five minutes. You know, like none of us wanted to search for vintage Barbies on eBay. And I swear that's what motivated her to learn to read and write. And now she's an avid reader and writer. But there had to be something that <laughs> was that important. So I, I think the thing is, I've known other unschooling families. And I thought the thing, part of why our situation worked as well as it did was that the trust was absolute. Like the trust, I don't think my parents found my magazine very interesting. And we certainly didn't find my brother's baseball cards interesting when he went through that phase. But they, our interests were always respected, whatever they might be, and we kind of were able to really indulge in them and work through them. And maybe there was something we were getting that wasn't apparent. So, I mean, I think if you're going to take the alternative education route, that, that trust has to be really profound. And I think I, you know, when I saw myself with my younger sister not having that trust, um, and it was interesting. I have the microphone, but I worry about from a... If you come from your family, which you have a father who's working, working in academia, that might be different than my family, which is a single mom who's barely mm -hmm. surviving financially. Like, they have the trust that they can afford to support you, perhaps, mm -hmm. into your adulthood until you're ready. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, my parents went, I mean, my parents went bankrupt when I was 18 or something like that. So I never sort of thought I was going to be financially supported. But there was this, a, there was not a fear of the academy. That was certainly true, right? Like, there wasn't a sort of fear of the ivory tower or a sense that it was inaccessible to us. And I think that was a, a privilege, right? The sense of sort of entitlement to that world if we wanted it. Um, and, it, and I think it does have, um, it does carry a different meaning for the, ch the children of a professor to be kept at home and unschooled as opposed to, you know, a working class single mother. I mean, our, our people, strangers will project something different on those experiences, and I think that's a problem. But um, it's, a, I'm not sure. I don't have kids, so I'm not sure of how to raise them. <laughs> I only know what it was like to be one. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you've talked a lot about your siblings, and um, we have an only child, and I'm wondering how you think that yeah. would impact this whole unschooling mm -hmm. if you were an only child. Yeah. I think it would make it a bit urgent, more urgent to have what I, what, what I wanted, actually, as a kid, which I kind of wanted to unschool myself for my academics. But then to get together with other kids to be really creative and do projects and do things that were fun. And maybe that had some sort of, you know, intellectual overtones. But um, the socialization, I think, would be certainly more crucial. But I, I think another secret, another aspect of unschooling that I'm really grateful for was just the aspect of solitude. I mean, there were three of us at home when I was growing up, you know, because the youngest one is so much younger than me. She doesn't really count. Um, but a lot of it was just, <laughs> I mean, I never actually, I left home when she was very young, so. Um, but we were by ourselves all the time, you know, in our own rooms, in our own space. I mean, you know, we played, but we also, there was a lot of solitude. And I, I feel very um, grateful for that, especially now that I'm sort of off on my own being self-employed and making films and 
I feel, so I, I'm not sure I would be so afraid of having an only child in school. I would just want to make sure that they were in a community that was a bit more accepting or open-minded or larger than ours was. Yep, I just had a quick question on, um, I don't know if you had seen that movie Surfwise, but yeah. it was almost like a documented unschooling mm -hmm. movie. Just what your thoughts were on that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Surfwise, it's a movie about a guy who's a doctor. He's very straight-laced in the 50s, and then he kind of discovers the counterculture and has this total flip, kind of like Timothy Leary or somebody like that, and becomes this uh, crazy figure and has like 10 kids and keeps them in a nomad, like a, what are they called, a Winnebago. Um, I, I saw that a year ago. My mom just saw it, actually, we were talking about it, and she, her thoughts on that film she basically thought, oh, it's too bad that guy wasn't doing it a few years later when there was more of a community or some sort of sense of social support. I mean, he was such, he was so the vanguard of that lifestyle. Um, and from, to my mind, he was a bit too militant and authoritarian. Um, but I thought it was interesting, and I thought, you know, his, his kids didn't seem any worse off than they would have been if they had been sent to school and they had such a weird dad. Yeah. Um, what struck me about your experience is that both your parents seem very educated. Your father's a college professor, your mom's an artist. Um, how do you see unschooling working with people who perhaps don't have that type mm -hmm. of preparation or perhaps don't have the resources? Perhaps you've met people and you could kind of comment on that. Yeah. Um, there were our unschooling community and was very small, but the other families actually tended to be more blue collar. So my very best friend growing up, her dad worked at Kinko's and her mom uh, worked at a restaurant. So, um, you know, it, they all turned out fine. I think that question makes sense, but it also comes from a place of assuming that, you know, you need to be educated to unschool your kids and that's, that, I kind of don't agree with that. Um, but I, I mean, we, again, it's an imperfect world, it's a complicated world, and society will perceive you in a certain way if you don't have certain degrees and you're keeping your kids at home. Maybe doors won't be open to you. I mean, I think more than my parents being um, educated was this sense, as I said before, of not feeling like that world, the ivory tower world, was closed to us. We knew we had that privilege, and that was empowering. But I'm not sure that was such an essential ingredient to the actual experience of learning. Well, I mean, things, what I meant was things like, I mean, you know, the book Watership Down happens to be in your house, or, yeah. you know, you had musical instruments. Perhaps mm -hmm. if parents were less schooled, they may not know to have that, those resources yeah. available. No, I think so. And that, I mean, I, I really, you know, I tried to make it evident in my talk that I, I actually support the sort of public the cause of public education. And I think that's one of the reasons, is the sharing of resources. Um, and I just wish that it could be done in a less all-consuming way, you know? So, sure, there could be families, I mean, there are probably families where I would think, God, I wouldn't want to be your child at home with you all day long in your house full of books I don't agree with. But I'm not sure that educational credentials or having degrees are, are the criteria. I mean, for example, my sister might very well never get a college degree. And, you know, but I can see her homeschooling her kids just fine. So I think it's complicated. It's a, it depends on the person. I have two questions. Um, uh, the first question has to do with financial support because, um, just wondering if um, you have any suggestions for how would you support your kid financially, yeah. if you have a comment about that, um, who is heading into their late teens or their early adulthoods and, you know, um, anyway, if you just have some suggestions about that. The second um, question was, is this was a re really, really good lecture that you just gave. Are you thinking or is there any possibility that you might start taking this into um, a larger venue, like into the homeschooling communities and become a keynote speaker at some of those events? Because I think a lot of the information you had to share tonight about your own personal experiences and your thoughts on unschooling mm -hmm. are extremely valuable and um, would do a lot for 
people in all types of different educational forms. Well, thank you. Uh, no, I just gave, I wrote the talk for tonight, so I hadn't really thought about it. Um, it seemed very idiosyncratic to me, so I wasn't sure if it would relate to people. Um, supporting kids in their teens and 20s, I don't know. I sort of, I mean, I think one thing, one distinction in my mind, and it might be completely arbitrary between homeschooling and unschooling, is that homeschooling kind of, in my opinion, it's more based on this coddling, right? Like the constant, the constant engagement with the child, the teaching them, the sort of helicopter parenting, as we like to call it, you know, but maybe more intense. Um, unschooling, even though people don't think it, don't think of it uh, in this way. It's very hands off, right? It's like, so I, as far as like supporting a kid in their teens and twenties, I mean, it's sometimes a lack of support can be very useful. A lack of guidance can also be sort of useful. Um, that said, I think my parents are still supporting my brother who's 25, so. <laughs> they didn't do that for me, but I, maybe that's why I'm tougher. <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm reminded of what Oscar Wilde said about education. He said, education, uh, he said the only time my education was ever interrupted was when I had to go to school. Yeah, it's a very good quote. Um, uh, the the people you mentioned, you know, uh, actually Thomas Jefferson was formally educated up to the age of sixteen, at which point he went to he entered William and Mary College. He had a private tutor, mm. but the other ones, you know, and there's many, many, many more than that. Uh, you can go back to Plato and Socrates and all that. Uh, also, the thing about the ivory tower thing. There's a cult of education at our universities and colleges. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, I, I was an independent scholar at the University of Minnesota for 33 years before I was kicked out of the library for trespassing. Um, they, the, 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 they, there's some things, that it, it, a lot of it is politics at, at the universities and colleges. They, the, the, the professors don't even agree with each other on, on curriculums and, and and um, and points of of, of of interest in 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 in, in facts. Um, what was I going to say? Um, oh yeah, it was a question. I was going to. Oh yeah, the question was um, that I don't know why 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 do people think that it, the, the norm is actually uh, education is a process, not an institution. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the norm is people just learning. Most people learn most of what they know on their own anyway. They don't learn them in, in, in universities and colleges. I have a seventh grade education. And I, uh, I mean formally, and I learned everything. I, 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 uh, Eric Hoffer was my idol when I was a lot younger. He was the guy that uh, had almost no formal education at all. And he was appointed to President Johnson's Council on Civil Disorders. Mm -hmm. And uh, he... He um, uh, he wrote several books called uh, Ordeal of Change, uh, uh, True Believer. A lot of a lot of great. They were kind of conservative, but they were they were you know really good good books on 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 sociology. Uh, my question: What was the question? Yeah, the question was why should it be? Um, why do people think that that's that's unusual to be, you know to not have formal education? It, it mm -hmm. it's actually the norm. That, yeah. That's all. I mean. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think what, one thing I tried to say is that unschooling happens all around us, and uh, it's sort of something we don't recognize. The other thing is this equation we have, between, you know, of learning with schooling that is just sort of problematic. I mean, one doesn't necessarily uh, equal the other. As far as my comments about the ivory tower and the academy, I mean, I, I hope that my lecture expressed some of my ambivalence, uh, meaning, you know, my passionate attachment as well as sort of my passionate critique of the university system. I mean, as you see in those quotes from Marland and, and the stuff about Nixon, you know, this sort of uh, liberal curriculum, the humanities, a lot of the stuff that's taught in the university is threatening to the status quo. And so the university does need to be sort of protected and cultivated, and I think it is necessary. I love the sort of eccentric focus that certain professors are allowed to cultivate within the academy, and many students have their minds blown there 
you know, and are exposed to things they would never otherwise be exposed to. So I think it's an important space. I just wish that its doors could be opened a bit. And that's, for example, what I tried to do with my film Examine Life, taking these philosophers, you know, into the streets and into movie theaters and trying to bring a discourse that is typically kind of um, out of view of most people because it's a very academic one and sort of share it with a broader public. So. Oh. Oh, um, I was just wondering, because earlier you had talked about um, unschoolers that had been probably like caught up in the system by like, you know, their parents who wouldn't even think to have their children do that. And so they go to high school yeah. and then they go off to college. So I was just wondering what your take is, what would be on um, like universities that you know allow you to build your own program since you're already used to mm -hmm. like the like the curriculum like having day-to-day -day assignments but yet you really want to learn mm -hmm. on your own what like universities that um let you build your own curriculum as opposed to like a self-paving self-taught education higher education yeah um Ultimately, that's what attracted me to Brown. It famously has no core curriculum you have to take. And then when I went back to the University of Georgia, I did an interdisciplinary degree that I kind of designed. And I also have an interdisciplinary degree. I have a master's in liberal studies from the New School. So that was the framework that I felt most comfortable in. Um, but what's, I, I think the thing is there's really no reason you couldn't have that outside of the university framework and not pay so much money for it, right? Like. I'm going to my Hegel reading group on Saturday morning with 10 people, some of whom know Hegel much better than me, and you know we meet every week, and it's very serious. And it's like a graduate seminar, but it doesn't cost 6,000 bucks. So it depends really, you know, what are you going for? What are you trying to get out of it? And I, you know, again, I'm just, I'm committed to this idea of some sort of intellectual community that doesn't end at the age of 22 or 27 or whatever, that can be part of your daily practice. I don't understand why that's so elusive. Mm -hmm. Two more questions. Oh. Hi. I was just thinking that in alternative education, it seems like less is more. And mm -hmm. for those who have less, what are the absolute essentials to, to ex access that level of education that people with non-education mm -hmm. seem yeah. to get? Um. So you're asking me what what are what are sort of the essentials that sort of less privileged populations need to access? Well, they need to access one thing that I don't think they're really getting in the public school system often, which is a sort of trust in them, right? I mean, public school the public school system is famously imbalanced in its treatment of people from different class backgrounds, right? Because it's funded disproportionately. So, I'm not I'm not sure that it's so clear that Unschooling is only sort of an option for people of economic privilege or, or intellectual privilege. I mean, that's sort of what Co the point I was trying to make through COSAL, which is that the people who are really being beaten down in public schools and being tracked into remedial courses and being told they're not gifted and being told that their future is working at McDonald's are precisely the people who need the sort of spirit of unschooling, which is the spirit of trust in curiosity, trust in your capacity. So. Um, what do you need access to? I'm not sure, you know. A few a good library, some inspiring role models who are really interested in things so that you can see that it'll, sort of life of the mind is an exciting and engaging way of being. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I don't really have an answer. I just know that school isn't always the best place even for those who have the least. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. You're, you're as far as I can see, so I keep looking at you. Yeah. Um, I have a child. I'm homeschooling for the first time this year, and I don't. I guess we're not. I'm. I guess I'm tired of the unschooling versus homeschooling, and mm -hmm. you know, curriculum based versus you know, relaxed classical approach. Um, I came tonight because I'm kind of worried, because there's been a couple articles that um, a gentleman has done on salon. Oh, and yeah. it's gotten an overwhelmingly negative 900 letters per. I read the first one, and I was like, "Well, he's setting himself up." It here. was he was really skewered. Yeah. And um, and I sort of appreciated his article just because you know he really kind of laid out how he was doing it. Um, 
because I think sometimes when you're new to it, everybody's like, well, it just happens, you know? And that kind of ambiguity doesn't always help. But that, the fact of the matter was, he was just skewered by a really yeah. liberal base. Yeah. And um, I guess I would just like to see, like, those line, those distinctions between, like, how we homeschool, mm-hmm. you know what, and stop calling it, you know, if you happen to have curriculum that you're mm-hmm. helicopter parenting yeah. or, you know, I just, I think those sort of judgments on those worlds are the same ones that make it hard to unschool because people mm-hmm. are judging. You I, know what I mean? I think, yep. I think the discussion has to be broadened that we're just doing what's best for our kids. I have one child who's still in public school. I have one that's at home because mm-hmm. that's what they chose this year. Mm-hmm. One chose to stay at home. One chose to go to school because he loves it. You know, so in our house, it's important that we're not, you know, hacking on one. Or the other. Yeah. No, and I, mean, I think that our, as a, I mean, we're such a small minority of people that educate their kids at home mm-hmm. with our own resources, with our own time. And it's, you know, whether or not you're leading or not, it's exhausting, you know. And then the fact that a liberal base is still sort of hacking on one another, and then there's this discourse between. You know, I just, I would like the there to be a better culture of acceptance, mm-hmm. whether or not, you know, people are conservative or liberal or, you know, just that you've done something brave and wonderful. And, mm-hmm. you know, obviously it shows that, you know, it worked yeah. for you guys. I agree with the sentiment of camaraderie, but I disagree with letting the distinction between the words go away. I think words really matter, and that unschooling has a meaning, a resonance that just homeschooling just doesn't have. It is it is more pointed, and it, but it's also more direct, and it was a more honest term to describe what I experienced and what I thought was valid about it. So I think that you're absolutely right. People could talk about homeschooling and unschooling and not be superior not be critical, be mutually supportive, and that would all be good. But I think the word really matters. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as engaged by the word homeschooling. I think that it doesn't communicate to someone coming from a different world what it is I'm trying to communicate so directly. Um, and as far as the response to the Salon article, I mean, I'm not surprised. I used to be very confused when I was a kid, and my mom, we'd sort of run into people, you know, strangers would come up to us at, the grocery store in the afternoon and go, oh, why are your kids here? And she'd be like, oh, they're just out of, you know, out of school for the day. And she wouldn't sort of say to them, we homeschool, we unschool. And she, at one point she said, it's because I just don't feel like getting in an argument. I don't feel like making that person feel as though I'm judging them when I'm not. I just happen to choose to keep you guys at home or you guys are choosing to stay at home. And that's that. So 90% of the time she wouldn't engage anybody about it um, because that hostility was the common reaction. So um, I think you're right that, you know, solidarity and mutual support in this movement is a good thing, but I still... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that they're... I, I'm not sure they're so worried about what it is you're doing. They're worried about what it is they're doing. Or it wouldn't be that intense and critical and hostile. You know, it's like, well, what are your kids doing today that's so great? And maybe that's what you're worried about, you know? So, because that, it's, that, that intensity is really, it's visceral. And it's, because you're threatening something that they probably spent 13 to 17 years of their life invested in. And they've invested their children's lives in. So that's a very, um, that's an intimate thing to go challenging, right? Yeah, just by being out. <laughs> cool. Um, I think, are we done? Okay. Um, thank you all for coming to my very first lecture. I appreciate it. Thank you.